Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's been a couple of weeks since I released a video, but here's the third part of the 200 amp service upgrade in Atlantic Highlands. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope your holidays were festive and fantastic. And thanks for coming back and watching these videos. So this is the third part of this series of this 200 amp service. So what I need to do here is I'm mounting the meter. And uh, obviously you see, I got to move that old foam box a little bit to the left which uh, fortunately had enough slack on the wire, so I was able to do that. So I could fit my 200 amp JCP&L meter enclosure to the wall. So what I'm doing here is I'm working with one of the rarely seen 200 amp meter enclosures uh, that I was able to obtain, thanks again to Powers Electric for that. Uh, without them, I don't know if I could, uh, could have finished this job as quickly as I did. So I'm just prepping this meter enclosure by uh, getting the hub up on the top. Actually, it might have come with the hub. Uh, but right here, I'm just knocking out this eccentric knockout. And you want to do this careful uh, so you don't knock it out to two and a half inches and have to use a reducing uh, washer. Sometimes we call that in the trade a donut uh, to make up for that. So I try to avoid that if I can. I have them on the truck just in case. But here I didn't need it because I was able to take out this knockout easily. Uh, so the way I like to do it is I like to stick my screwdriver, flathead screwdriver in there and pry a little bit and then come around so I get the four corners and then eventually knock it out with my uh, diagonal dike cutters. So once the meter's prepped, uh, I'm probably going to set this aside here and um, get a measurement on my conduit and make sure it's secure on the inside, make sure it's the right length on the outside before attaching the meter to the wall. So once the meter knockout is out, I put in this two inch service entrance and SEU connector, weatherproof connector on the line side from the riser of my 200 amp service here. And then of course I also like to put in my two inch male adapter, which will be the conduit going downstairs to the meter, uh, to the panel. And then of course we want to knock out <clears throat> these KOs for the uh, mounting screws on the back of the meter. Now I can put my meter right up against the side of the wall here and get a good accurate measurement without even using a tape measure to cut my PVC. And I'll come back with a sawzall and cut it. Obviously the footage got cut there, I don't know what happened. Uh, but now we get a nice dry fit and we make sure we're good on the, on the other side where the panel is before we attach it to the uh, house. That's all been done already. So we're using two inch corrosion resistant, the, the gray coarse screws with the Phillips head drives. Uh, I think we're one of the last trades to still use Phillips head drives. So before I get to all the wiring and the panel downstairs, I want to make sure that my electro conductor is in place. And this is my two ground rods. This is the grounding electro conductor from the two ground rods that gets connected inside the main breaker panel inside the house. So what I'm trying to do is push this wire through the old 100 amp service wire behind the mounting board and then I'll pull it around to install it inside the panel when I get down to the basement in a little while here. So it was a little chilly here on this day, uh, probably about 35 degrees. Obviously you can see I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt and a short sleeve shirt over that so it's not too cold. Uh, but this particular service entrance conductor can be stiff. So we want to open it up and walk it out and try to make it as straight as possible so it looks presentable on the house. And uh, by walking it out, you can achieve doing that. And so while the conductor's out and I got the table right here, what I'll do is I'll set up uh, my service entrance cap or my service head, we'll call it, okay? And so I like to set it up here on the table rather than up on the ladder because I'm a lot more mobile standing on the ground than I am on the ladder. That's the reason to do it. Plus you could do a nicer job. And so what we do is we strip back the conductors and take off the sheathing and then we attach this service head. And I like to put the grounds underneath the clamp right here. Uh, and then we'll twist it together to make it a nice solid conductor uh, before putting the service head cap back on. And then we'll walk up the ladder and fasten it to the side of the house. Once we have it uh, prepped, we carry it up the ladder one-handed here, just go uh, one, very easily one at a time. And I've already got a, a, a screw up there to actually hold the cap in place while I fasten it to the house. Now, the one rule here is that you have the first strap within 12 inches of that service head. And then of course you wanna have a strap within 12 inches of the meter enclosure. 
but you'll see later on um, that I won't make that final strap above the meter until after the service entrance conductor riser is inside the meter. So I have a little flexibility of getting that giant cable into the meter pan. Uh, being that this is a retro, this is a service upgrade, I'm trying to use the same holes they use in the siding so aesthetically it looks pleasing when I'm done. Of course, with a cable like this, I believe the minimum is four and a half feet between straps. Of course, I like to do a little bit more than that uh, just so it securely fastens at a house so a storm doesn't take it out, uh, stuff like that. So now I'm able to cut this uh, cable and I'll very gently here um, persuade the cable to go inside that connector on the top of the meter as you'll see here. So we'll loosen it up just enough so the cable could fit through there. It's a compression connection. Uh, we'll slide the service entrance cable through the connector and then we'll get a pair of uh, a couple pairs of giant sized uh, channel locks and uh, we'll tighten it down. Now I can put my strap in as you can see. Uh, one of the things I had to do here in order to tighten <clears throat> the compression connector here uh, was I needed to back off the screws uh, from the meter. And I'm not sure if I've done that yet, but I'm struggling here and I want to get a nice tight fit uh, before putting the duct seal in a cone-like fashion on the top of the connector. Maybe I edited it out, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I had to, um, to get that tight, I had to uh, back out the screws before... Um, tightening up the connector and here we'll just do the duct seal on top if you haven't seen this before this is how we in the northeast this is how we do it uh, we use the compression connector which accounts for a lot of the water um, not coming into the meter uh, but this duct seal finishes off the job uh, and then in about 10 years or so this duct seal might get dry and dried up and start cracking so you want to make sure you use the duct seal that's rated for the exterior it'll say it right there on the package uh, keeping water out of this meter enclosure is uh, very important. So I'm using duct seal as I'm reinserting my screws to attach the meter to the house. Duct seal has to be rated for the outdoors if you're going to use it outdoors. And it'll specifically say that right on the package of the duct seal. Uh, I know sometimes at the big orange box store, uh, they'll sell duct seal there, but it's not rated for outdoors. At least here at the Brick location in Brick, New Jersey. So I have to go elsewhere to get that duct seal. Probably good friend Electric. Um, Brick Boulevard and Brick. Shout out. And uh, so you want to make sure that that stuff is rated for the outdoors. Otherwise it'll fail. And then you'll get water inside your meter enclosure. And your customer will be wondering why they hired you to do the job and you don't do it right. So make sure you check your duct seal that it's rated for outdoors if you're going to be using it outdoors. <clears throat> now, in order to strip back this sheathing, it is awfully thick. Uh, it keeps the water out. Obviously, it's rated for outdoors, this material. And I know you don't use this service entrance cable unprotected outdoors in other parts of the country. I get that. I hear that. And I get that comment a lot on this channel. But here in the Northeast, we use it all the time as long as it's not subject to physical damage. And if it's above, if it's the service riser, uh, the line side of the meter... <clears throat> 95% of the time, it's not subject to physical damage, and it's acceptable, and so we use it. I like to open up the bottle, the cap, and push the bottle up onto the conductor to get plenty of Penetrox, or I'm sorry, get plenty of antioxidant. I believe Penetrox is a name brand. Uh, let me know in the comments. Pretty sure it was called Penetrox. That's what we used to use, and that was the brand name. Kind of like when you ask for a soda, you just say, give me a Coke. 
Um, but the antioxidant, I like to uh, make sure there's plenty on there before terminating these conductors. And so what I'll do here before I cut them is I'll mark them so I know exactly where to cut the one conductor. And then I'll take my cutters again here and cut the other one to the exact same length. Uh, then I'll get my Klein stripper for 4 aught aluminum, which is what this cable is. And I'll strip back the cables and get a dry fit um, before I get the Penetrox on there because it does get a little sloppy. Even if you wear gloves, you're still going to be slipping. So I usually don't put gloves on, but as you can see, I apply plenty of the antioxidant on the conductors before uh, trying to get this <clears throat> trying to get the seal on the connector here. This is the, probably the part of the job that I like the least, uh, only because I do use the antioxidant and it can get sloppy. It'll get on your fingers, it'll get on your tools. And then obviously I put my tools in my pocket, so now it's all over the back side of my pocket and it's all over my hands and it's just all over the place I can get sloppy. And I've been doing this for a long time. Um, so if you can do this without getting sloppy on you, that is awesome. All right, so the line side of the meter has been terminated. Now what I'm doing is I'm using the rest of my service entrance cable here to get the rest of my conductors through from the meter on the load side of the meter down to the main breaker panel in the, in the uh, basement. Well, actually the first floor. It is a bi-level house. So, uh, so I'm stripping back this <clears throat> sheathing. And then what I'll do is I'll get a nice measurement on my first conductor, probably would be my neutral conductor, uh, before cutting it and uh, making a, a permanent uh, termination from the meter and at the main breaker panel. This takes time and if I can avoid using the uh, uninsulated conductors as my neutral, I'll do that. So I had enough conductors here to do that. And so what I'll do is I'll re-identify the uh, black conductor here with white tape. And you're allowed to do that uh, starting with number four uh, AUG conductors. So I'm just re-identifying here and I'm a big fan of making this a complete um, making the complete conductor identified with white tape not just candy striping it. I was taught this way uh, to put extra tape on it. Tape's not expensive. This way it's fully identified and uh, thank you to my boss many many years ago who told me to do it like that. All right, so I got my measurement on the inside. Now I'm going to get my measurement on the outside. And then I'll do the same for the two hot conductors, et cetera, et cetera. So when doing these service upgrades, there's a lot of walking back between where the panel is, where the meter is, and where my truck is. So we go from the truck to the meter to the panel, from the panel back to the meter, back to the panel, back to the meter, back to the truck, back to the panel, back to the meter, so on and so forth. So there is a lot of work walking back and forth, which I guess a helper could help me with. Um, I just prefer working alone. Um, I'm doing it like this for a long time. And uh, this is what I'm comfortable with. But I imagine as I get older, I'll need a helper. I've had them in the past. Um, but the trouble is uh, reliability. And I know a lot of other electrical contractors going through that same problem over and over and over again. I just prefer to not have that, uh, that problem or that benefit, whichever way it works out. Terminating the conductors inside the meter is probably my least favorite part of my job. Uh, mostly because there's not a lot of room inside the enclosure here. There's enough. Obviously, it's been approved by the utility company. So, obviously, there is enough bending radius room in there. Uh, but it's awfully difficult to work to get the right size, uh, to get the conductor down to the right size before terminating it in their lugs. Uh, and then, of course, once the penetrox on the cable, before you attach the lugs... Uh, sometimes that can be a little sloppy. So as you can see here, I'll use my hammer, uh, the butt end of my hammer, to persuade the conductor 
into position before uh, attaching the lug. Now the lug um, attaches through two slots on either side of the termination here. And so you got to get the conductor in there and slide the lug into place. And with the Penetrox, it's not always easy because there's not a lot of room, again. Uh, but once you get it in there, then you can tighten it down. And usually there's enough flex still in the, in the conductor to hold the lug in place uh, before using the Allen wrench key um, or the hex key to tighten the lug. I, I really just hate this part of the job but uh you got to do it so i've tried to make it the easiest way i can do it and if you know any other ways of making it simpler i'd love if you'd leave them down in the comments <clears throat> so now that the outside is pretty much done uh, the meter i'm able to uh, start putting my circuits into the panel and um i couldn't find my bx cutters that i have i have a green lead bx cutter I don't know where they are, and if you're like me, you have a lot of tools, and sometimes you don't know where the hell all of them are, and that was the case here. So that's why I'm using this bandsaw to cut the, um, the metal sheathing around this armored cable. Otherwise, I would use my BX cutters. Of course, my BX cutters were right there in my Vito tool pouch, uh, but I forgot that I put them there, and uh, so I didn't know where they were, even though they were right in front of my face. So flagging the play for me. But the good news is I did was able to cut them with the bandsaw and there were no shorts. And of course, you see, I use those little red anti-shorts uh, to prevent any shorting. So that definitely helps. But I was careful not to nick any of the conductors when using that bandsaw. I definitely don't condone doing that. And I hope I don't have to do that again. I would definitely prefer to use the BX cutters. Uh, so I'm using a, a double BX connector there. And we'll tighten down the lock nut. And then what we'll do is we'll run a couple of conductors through that little nipple going from the four inch square box into the panel. And uh, we'll make sure we run individual neutrals and hots uh, for each of the two circuits. I got to do the same thing on the other side. And the reason why I needed to put these boxes in is because there was only a limited amount of um, <clears throat> knockouts in the top of the panel here because I'm using the Square D Home Line Quick Connect system here. And I've used that before, and I thought it would come in handy on this job because the panel is gonna be, the top of the panel is gonna be so close to the ceiling. The, the, the ceiling here is maybe six and a half feet, maybe seven at the most. Uh, so there's a little bit of headroom there. And with the armored BX cable, you're not gonna be able to bend that into an angle to get it into the top of the panel through a connector, unless you use a 90 degree connector. Uh, but I chose to put these four inch square boxes on either side to accommodate the uh, armored BX cable. Now this might look like a big giant spaghetti mess. And if that's what you think, you would be right. Uh, but fortunately, I labeled all my circuits, so I know exactly what each of them, one of them do. Or rather, I don't know what the, what the, what part of the house they serve, but I do know where, they, where they're terminated later on. You're either going to have a black or a red, and that's going to be going to your circuit breakers, or you're going to have a bare copper uh, wire, <clears throat> or you're going to have the shielding around the BX cable, and those are going to be your grounds. And of course, the white wires are always going to be your neutrals, so... As you can see, there's one crumpled up red wire up at the top there. That's because that's the way it was before. And that's the way it's going to be this time. And we're just going to leave like that, cap it off. So once all my neutrals and grounds are terminated, I'm able to start putting in some circuit breakers, which you'll see here shortly. And uh, we always put the circuit breakers in sized on the size of the conductor. That we're terminating so if it's a 14 gauge wire we put that under a 15 amp breaker and if we have a 12 gauge wire we put that under a 20 amp breaker and if it's a 10 gauge wire we put that under a 30 amp breaker now normally 30 amp breakers on single pole 120 volt circuits aren't very common uh, so normally a 30 amp circuit is going to be a double pole 30 amp circuit which means we have two single 30 amp 
breakers with a common trip. That's what a double pole circuit breaker is. And that'll put out 240 volts and that's 120 volts from each of the legs coming into the house. You have that red leg and you have that black leg. And so as you go down the panel, they alternate on the bus bar from the left side to the right side, to the left side, to the right side. And then there's another leg that comes down that starts on the right and goes to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. So when you put that double pole circuit breaker, you attach it to the bus bar, that's how you derive 240 volts for that circuit. I hope I made that as clear so you can understand exactly what that means. So the higher the voltage, the lower the amperage. But the watts, whether it's single pole or double pole, are always going to be the same. So if you have a 7200 watt uh, a circuit, that would be 30 amps at 240 volts, okay? But if that was a 120 volt circuit, it would be 60 amps. So you'd have to use that size wire for a single pole 60 amp circuits. I hope you can understand that. But that's why we don't, that's why we go to 240 volt double pole circuits to accommodate that large conductor. Doing these 200 amp service upgrades by myself is usually a very long day. Uh, most of the time I prep uh, two or three days before I even decide to do the service or the day that it's scheduled. And the morning I get there, usually around 8 a.m., maybe 8.30 a.m., usually 15 minutes past that, uh, I tell my customers that the power will be off and that the power will be back on by 5 p.m. at the latest. Now, certain conditions determine whether or not I'm able to meet that criteria. But <clears throat> I do try to tell people that the power will be off for most of the day, not to open up the refrigerators too often, especially in the summertime. But in the wintertime, that's less of a factor. The biggest factor in the wintertime is, of course, daylight. And so once I don't have the daylight, that makes things a little more complicated. But I do have plenty of lights, thanks to Milwaukee and Milwaukee Tools. But working in the dark is not something that I like. Uh, this basement, obviously, I got a light on the whole day because there's very little sunlight that gets shined. It's not even the basement. It's the first floor of a bile of a house. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that in this video. Um, but I like to do the work in a nice workmanlike manner. And I think I've achieved that here on this job. Let me know what you think down in the comments. So now that the panel's all wired up and the meter's been terminated and all our grounding electroconductors are in place, the final step of this service upgrade process is to reconnect from the utility. And that's what I'm doing here. So I got this big giant light up there because it is dark and I got a headlamp on obviously. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is I want to attach my grounded neutral conductor to the service utility grounded neutral conductor. Then from there, I'll do one of the hot legs and then I'll do the other hot leg. And I use my hex head uh, T-tool to tighten down these butt splices that are rated for to do this work right here. This is the easiest way to attach it. These butt splices are about $9 a piece. So it's not cheap, um, but when you're up there on the ladder like I am here, you want it to be as easy as possible. And so now I've kind of got it down to where I need my hex head, I need some vinyl tape, I need some rubber splicing tape, and uh, of course I use my, my uh, pliers here to strip back some of the wires <clears throat> from the service. And uh, so you just do this one at a time and you make sure you're not grounded. Uh, otherwise, that current will have a path to flow and you could get lit up like a Christmas tree. So be careful. I, I, if you're a homeowner thinking about doing this work yourself, definitely consult with your power company uh, first. They might come out and do this portion for you. Uh, they probably will charge you to do that, but I don't know for sure. I don't have to call them, fortunately, to do any shutoff here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure in New Jersey, we'd be billed for something like that. But if you don't feel safe doing that, and you want to call your utility company to check with them, I highly advise that you do so. So now that I've connected back to the utility, I'm going to check the line side of this meter and I want to, I expect to see 240 volts from hot leg to hot leg. And then of course, 120 volts from hot leg to ground on both sides. And that's what I have. 
So now I'm able to install the meter safely and uh, just use a little shove right there to put it inside to attach it to the enclosure. Now I'm going to check the load side for the same voltage that I had on the line side and I do. And so I like to make sure I mark the date, the weather on the back of the meter. That's just something I learned from other electricians here in New Jersey that I've been doing for the last few years. So you got to put these yellow covers on there, right? But it's nice what Square D does is they leave these little probe holes for my tester. See? In, in, 240 volts coming in on the line side. All right? Then the breaker, the main breaker turns on and energizes the bus bar. So when you turn it on, just raw human, I always stand away. I'm behind the camera here. <clears throat> and the reason why I do that is because if there's an arc, I don't want to lose my face. Uh, I can lose my hand and I could live the rest of my life without my hand, but not without my face. So when you turn on the main breaker, stand away from it. Unfortunately, a lot of electricians get a bad, bad rep for not cleaning up. However, I don't believe in that. I believe in cleaning up. I believe it's very important to clean up. And so I use a drop cloth here to drop all the wires down during the day. And then I just bundle up this drop cloth and I'll drop it off inside a garbage can at some point later on. <clears throat> here I'm using hydraulic concrete. And the hydraulic concrete sets up very fast and expands as it cures. So inside this hole, you'll fill it and then it'll expand so that no water can get into it. And uh, this is just a fantastic product. If you're a service electrician, you should definitely keep this on your truck. That's how I was taught. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I like to be sure that I've counted the right amount of circuit breakers that have been installed so I can match that when I'm knocking out my knockouts here from the panel. And once all the knockouts are out, we'll take the panel cover screws and we'll attach the panel cover to the panel itself. And then we'll almost be done with this job. We'll have to come back another day to label all the circuits, uh, which is exactly what we did. And I'll show that to you here in a moment. Now, for whatever reason, this enclosure was kind of bent out, and those two middle screws that attached the panel cover to the panel were out of whack. And I didn't discover this until I went to go put the panel cover on. Um, you'll see this screw coming up right here in the middle. I don't even see the screw hole. I'm not sure what's going on with there. So I have to use some persuasion in order to get this uh, panel cover screw in, and you'll see what I do here in a second. I use these two clamps back to back, which I learned from some carpentry uh, videos here on YouTube. Use both of these, I squeezed it, and then I'm able to see the screw hole through the panel cover here, and I'm able to get my panel cover on uh, properly. Very important that that panel cover is on correctly, for sure. How about that? That's what I'm talking about. Now here's something very few electricians do, unfortunately, is clean up. But for me, I'm in a service business here. I do service electric work. So cleaning up and showing up on time and doing what you say you're going to do are three of my solid rules for being an electrical contractor. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like button and hit the subscribe button. Thanks, guys. We'll see you on the next one.